welcome to Jupiter Natural. This is a course put together by JLI, and I'm excited. It's a, it's a shorter course. Typical, some most some courses are six weeks. This is only four weeks. Um, we're going to be here exploring the paranormal, the ideas of dreams. What does Judaism have to say about dreams? Um, the um, demons and angels, superstitions. Kamsa, red string, water, um, astrology, all that exciting stuff. So, the, um, there's a guy that comes to a psychologist. He says, I got a problem. I have these terrible nightmares every night. I dream that, I dream that somebody is hiding under my bed. And I can't sleep at night. I wake up with these panics. And the psychologist looks and says, look, this is a real deep problem you got. I can, tr I can treat you. It's about two years of heavy therapy once a week or twice a week. Each session is $150. And the guy says, well, I have to think about it. And he leaves. A few months later, he never goes back. A few months later, he bumps into the therapist in the supermarket. The therapist asks him, so how's it going? He says, I have, everything is going wonderful. He says, what, what happened? He says, well, I went to my rabbi, and my rabbi in one minute fixed the problem. <laughs> he says, what happened? What did the rabbi tell you? I told my rabbi, I, I, I have this nightmare There's, that somebody's sleeping under my bed, and I can't do it. So my rabbi says, very simple, go home and cut the legs of your bed. And ever since... <laughs> So, simple, simple. And really, that's what I want to do in this class. I just want to give you jokes, and then we all cover, and we're good to go. But all seriousness, uh, I want to, we don't want to go too crazy about things, and we're going to explore the beauty and the richness in Jewish teachings and wisdom. And we're going to explore, and this is a lot of them, a lot of this class and this course is actually text-based. Uh, we're not going to just make up things. We're going to we'll show you. The, the wisdom of our teachings of, two, of three and a half thousand years of teaching, if not more, mainly from, of course, from the Torah, from, from the Scripture, from the Oral Torah, from the Zohar, from the Kabbalah, and a lot of Talmud that we're going to explore. So, let's jump in, and we're going to start about, the topic is about dreams. Um, and we'll discuss the meaning of dreams, and we'll start with a little video about a very famous story, and that is, of course, the audio doesn't work. <laughs> okay. okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to skip the video because it's really just a cute video, but it's not important to the class. I'm just going to give you what the video says. You all know this, the, so basically the story of the Titanic, right? Um, 1912. The, what, what was it called? The unthinkable, the unsinkable, right? So we have it in text one, I'm not going to read it, but this guy Isaac Frauenthal basically books a ticket on, on the Titanic and then a few nights before he's about to go on the Titanic, he has his dreams. And in the dreams he sees that the Titanic is going to sink. And he tells his family, you know, I had this dream, but, and they say, come on, what are you talking about? Stupid dream, don't worry about the dream. And the next night, and I guess two or three times he has the same dream that the Titanic is going to sink. And, but he wakes in the morning, the sun is shining, and, you know, he had this, this first class ticket. What would, you know, he says, and, and of course he boards the Titanic. And then the moment the, 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 the boat hits the iceberg, right, even after it hits the iceberg, the people at Titanic were not panicked. They didn't panic. They thought, oh, what? Big deal, right? It's the unthinkable. This is, it can't think. It can't sink. So when they, in the beginning, when they, uh, 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 not everybody was jumping on the lifeboats because people thought only once the boat really broke into pieces. That's when people really panicked. And this guy, this Isaac, right, and he, when he saw the 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 boat hitting the iceberg, what was he thinking right away? <laughs> of his dream, right? Now you bet that he jumped into this lifeboat first. He knew that this is really coming 
right? And how do we know all of this? Because he actually survived. He actually survived. So, yeah, you survived to share the story. Yeah, it's a real story. It's a real story. You think I make things up here today? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't dream it. This is a real story. You can look in text one. I'm going to jump because it's, it's, just to, it's just to bring out a point and a question. And because we have a lot to cover today, maybe in the, in the email you get to see the video. It's just a nice, cute video, nothing too serious. And um, all right, let me just mute people here on Zoom. That's it. So let me ask you a question. The question really is now, if you had been Isaac, if you had been in Isaac's position, would you have boarded the Titanic? Huh? Yes or no? By the way, would you board the Titanic? If you had dreams of the dream, right, that the Titanic is going to board, but you have a first class ticket, right, would you board? Huh? Yes? Who yes. say yes? yes? Probably. Probably. Who says no? Yeah, easy. Yeah, because you saw the movie. Yeah, easy. Yeah, of course not. <laughs> okay. Huh? All right. Yeah, you ready to pay first class ticket? Or if, I, if you would be Isaac's rabbi and he comes to the rabbi asking for the advice, what would you tell him? Stay home. Okay, so basically you're saying dreams are all true. Are you saying all dreams are true? No. So you will tell as a rabbi the guy just spent thousands of dollars, right? Stay home. I would tell him to take a life jacket. No, I'm joking. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. We're gonna. That's exactly the question. Do dreams have any true meaning? That's the yeah. question. You guys, you guys came for this class, right? Yeah. You want to know the answer? Yes. No. Conflict. Okay, that's why you pay for the class. I want the answer. Okay. <laughs> First class. First class. Okay. All right. We're gonna come back. Have you ever had a dream that seemed very real to you? Huh? Yes. Okay. All right. What criteria do you use to determine whether you take a dream seriously? All right. I mean, if you had dreams that seemed to be very real to you, how do you know it's really real? And when do you determine which, which dream is real and which dream is not so real? Now, do you think, huh? So you say it's a feeling. It's a feeling. So it's, if you feel it's real, you wake up, go with it, right? You would what? Well, your Baba said, in the dream, in the dream. Okay. And I'm sure everyone here has your own personal experience. Yes. Um, what did you have first? Yes. Was it black and white or in color? In, how about in 4D or 3D? <laughs> yeah. Okay, very good. Very good. Yep. Yes, Ronnie. Ronnie in the back. Okay. Okay. All right. So we kind of have, I think we have here a difference of opinion. Some people here in the crowd saying that most dreams are really are, are, are nonsense or just nice. And if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Don't pay too much attention. Is that what you're saying? Right? And the others say it really depends. Uh, yes? Interpretation of any dream should be positive. Interpretation of any dream should be positive. I like that. But what happens if you have really bad dreams? What happens if you have like real nightmares? See something you do. Okay. I, I like your approach. <laughs> You're a good, you must be my student because I love that approach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ethel. Okay, we got to move on. Yes? You don't see dreams at all? Very good. Some people, some people don't, don't have any dreams or don't remember the dreams. Like most people probably don't remember dreams at all. Um, and we're going to address that. Good. Last question. We're going to move on. Uh, yes. Uh, you had a question or a comment? I have a comment. Okay. With working with children, yes. when children are learning during the day, they have a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. What happens is that if they have a good night's sleep or a good rest during the day, they go 
very good. Yes, the other things that we're going to, we're going to address as well. A lot of things the kids that they, what they experience during the day, they dream at night. Yes, okay, moving on. If we had to, only if it's really important, but we have, we have a lot to cover. Can we wait for later? Go ahead. Last question. The question is the difference between a dream and a vision. Yes, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna hopefully address that as well because not only do you, not sometimes and we're gonna address it. Let's let's not jump ahead. We are we are have to. This is a course on the Jewish perspective, right? There's a lot out there about all these uh, topics. All right, I'm not gonna give you the other the non-Jewish perspective. The, and we're gonna give you the perspective from Torah. So start right from the get-go. If we open up the Torah, open up the Bible, first book of Genesis, it is full of what? Of dreams. Can anyone name dreams in Genesis? Any dreams? Who had, who dreams? Jacob's, Jacob's ladder. Yeah. Anybody else? Joseph. Joseph. Pharaoh. Yes. From the beginning, when God creates the luminary, yeah. it says in the Torah they were for a sign and for a season. Right. That will be next week's class, astrology. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, 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 yes. Good job. <laughs> but the dreams, all about dreams, not, not, not science. Those dreams, we have. Pharaoh, we have Joseph, we have Jacob, we have Abimelech, we have, we are, it's, it's full of dreams, right? And you can see here in your textbook, and we're going to, we're not going to read this in text, uh, page six, you have different dreams enumerated in the book of Genesis alone. And the rest of the Torah is full of dreams, especially God communicated to prophets via dreams. Every prophet, most prophets, their prophecy was communicated by while asleep, with the exception of Moses, Moshe got Moshe was uh, was 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 so such on a high level that God communicated while he was alive. But let's talk about Pharaoh's dream for a moment. In Pharaoh's dream, what happens? What was the detail? So he have he has he dreams about seven skinny cows, right, standing at the at the river, and seven fat cows next to seven fat cows. The seven skinny cows eat up the seven fat cows, and what happens? Seven skinny cows remain skinny, right? Perfect diet, like he's eating a lot of donuts and he's still and he gets skinnier and skinnier. All right, and he's perplexed. What is the meaning of that? And then another another set of dreams. Oh, what? Seven ears of 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 wheat, right? Of of uh, very healthy wheat, and then and then seven very cyclopte wheat, un unhealthy. Um, stocks of wheat. They swallow the healthy ones, and again, it has no effect at them. And Pharaoh calls on all calls in all his interpreters, all his wise men of, of Egypt, and nobody can interpret. Everyone comes up with different interpretation. Pharaoh says, "Doesn't make sense." Until he pulls out who? Joseph, right? Joseph, the Jewish kid who was in in a, in a prison exile, in a prison in a, a Egyptian prison, and Joseph interprets the dream beautifully. That what? That, that that means you're gonna have seven, you're gonna have seven good years. Have seven years of plenty, your economy is gonna be really good, and then there are gonna be seven bad years. And while you have the good years, make sure to save up for the seven bad years. And Pharaoh says, Wow, amazing. And most importantly, it is true, right? That the dream comes comes true. Um, so the first problem we see is that dreams have meaning. The challenge is we don't know what the meaning is because even Pharaoh had a hard time figuring it out. Number two, that um, Yosef himself was a dreamer. What was his dream? Earlier when he was a teenager, the Torah describes the famous dream of the stars and the sun and the moon where he sees the sun and the moon. He shares this with his brothers, right? That he, see, he dreamt. A star, the sun and the moon, and 11 stars. And there's one star in the middle. And the sun and the moon and all the 11 stars, they bow down to the middle star, right? And, and what, it, what, was, what was the interpretation of that, or his prediction, basically? That I am going to be the middle star, and all of you, my 11 brothers, and my father and my mother, the sun and the moon, are going to bow down to me. Did it happen? Yeah. Yes, he became the vice premier of Egypt. Right? It happened not 100% though. Which part was missing in the dream? The son, his mother was no longer alive. Right? So the dream came true almost full and fully, but one part wasn't really accurate. In other words, 
um, look into Talmud, the text two. On page, we're on page eight, all right? We're gonna read some text. Everything's in Hebrew, no worries. No, everything will be translated. Everything's in translation. And the Talmud explains, says, makes the following statement. Rabbi Yochan taught in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Just as there can never be wheat without chaff mixed in, so too there can never be a dream without nonsense mixed in. Rabbi Brachia taught, even though part of the dream may be fulfilled, the entirety of the dream is never fulfilled. The source for the statement is found in the story of Joseph's dream. Joseph dreamed that the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me, referring to his parents and 11 siblings. Yet at the time of the dream, Joseph's mother was already deceased. So, we have established that dreams have meaning, but we don't always know the meaning of a dream. Now, it's interesting. The Torah has, does, does the Torah mention every person's dream that ever, ha, ever had in Genesis? Every person in Genesis had many dreams. But the Torah picks only selected dreams, correct? <laughs> Obviously, those dreams had meanings. I'm sure there were many dreams that had no meaning at all. For that reason, why would the Torah write about everyone's dream that had no meaning? But we're talking about dreams that have meaning. And, but we're not sure what the meaning is. But we learned three things so far. Some dreams are meaningful, not all. Number two, the dream interpretation is not simple. Pharaoh couldn't figure it out, and he had a lot of wise people. And number three, dreams are never entirely accurate. Okay. We're going to build this up a bit. It's going to be a little like a text, build up, build up, and then we're going to a little Talmudic back and forth, and we're going to break the whole picture. The time we'll leave today about in another 45 minutes, you'll be fast asleep. <laughs> Dreaming. <laughs> Dreaming, yes, exactly. All right. All right. So the question really is, uh, does, does this help us? A bit, sort of, sort, of. sort of, right? It puts us a lot in limbo because the question is, if you say some dreams are meaningful, how do I know? I want to, I forget about the Bible, forget about the Genesis people. I want to know my dream. Does my dream have any meaning? How do I know if my, my dream has any meaning? And if it does have any meaning, what should I do about them? Right? How can I know? What is the meaning? What is the meaning about? Um, so we need to have some guidelines. So for we need to go into the Talmud. So the Talmud is a fascinating work. It is, it is the foundation of Jewish values and Jewish wisdom of these incredible sages 2,000, 2,500 years ago who got together. And they shared what they learned from previous generations and put together teachings that were extracted out of Torah. And what's really the most... So Talmud is, is, a, is a, I would say, 90% uh, halachic or legal... Jewish legal discussions. A lot of all about it was always discussions. You basically, it's a, trans, a transcript of um, of what was the debate in the in the in the Talmudic and the Jewish law uh, academies. They had these huge academies. Jewish teaching never died, even after the destruction of the temple, when Jews were exiled into Babylonia, today's uh, Iraq, um, Iran, Persia, that area. Like we have the story of Purim. They built. First thing they did, they built the yeshiva. They built that uh, Torah learning has to continue to build like, these academies. And so the debates in the academies was written down really word by word, and we have the Talmud today. So when you want to like kind of be the fly on the wall, you open the Talmud, you study the Talmud. And what's, what's, what's fascinating is many times there's stories, some of them are wild stories, and, we'll, and it just makes them for an exciting, and we're going we're gonna to share some, some wild stories today. All right, Talmud makes, uh, so Talmud, first thing, let's, let's, we got to pick from the Talmud um, guidelines. So Talmud makes a statement here in text 3, in the tract of Bachot. Talmud says, a dream is one sixties of prophecies. You have it? Page 10, text 3. Dream is one sixties of prophecy. What does that mean? Meaning, when you say the word prophecy, what does prophecy mean? Prophet, huh? The, the future, something that will happen in the future, right? Chabad is a non for profit. No, it's not for profit. 60, 160. What does that mean? It doesn't mean, so how can, 160, yeah? 
All right. So it doesn't mean that it's, it is that it's one sixty of the truth. Uh, what it means is that it's highly inaccurate. It's highly inaccurate, meaning the dreams talk are, are very indirect. Very indirect. They're not straightforward. A prophecy, a real prophet, gets hundred percent of the picture. This is what's going to happen. We, when we dream, we get a little a taste of something that can happen, but because it's so indirect, it's it's famished. We can't figure it out because it's not clear. Yes. So if we have sixty dreams, does it mean that we have? I knew that question was going to come up. <laughs> Should get the <a> cup. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's like a, it's like the it's like it's like the shul was trying to hire a cantor for the high holidays, and and it was ten thousand dollars. So they called the high cantor and says, "Can you give us a sample?" He says, "A sample? It's free." He says, "Okay, give us two days of sample." <laughs> <laughs> so, and fascinating is that the Talmud has a whole section that in, and it gives us if you have a dream about certain things, it has a certain message. Look over here in text at page 11. This is beautifully done. Look at this. The textbook of JLI this did an amazing job. But you see this, this if you have the uh, uh, dreams about activities, laying to fill in, right? What is the meaning? It says the dreamer should expect greatness and the reason. If you are uh, you dream about ripping one's clothes, oh, and then animals. We're not going to read this now. This is for you to read at home. Let's take it. This is fascinating read. Right? Okay, example. Uh, dreaming about snake is a good thing. If you have a dream about snakes, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah. Bad, right? No, Thomas is very good. What well, Thomas is very good. What does it say? The dreamer will find the livelihood with ease, right? The, and if the, if the bit, snake bit the dreamer, bad or good? Yeah. Double livelihood. Yeah. <laughs> if the dreamer killed the snake, bad. Your livelihood will be ruined. <laughs> Opposite. Isn't it amazing? That's fascinating. I love this stuff. Okay. Somebody should make a movie a movie about this, huh? Right? Everyone, everyone please dream about snakes tonight. <laughs> and then donate to Chabad. <laughs> okay, more on and on. I really don't want to go into the details here, please. There's, you can read it. Different animals, plants, and fruits. This is straight out of the Talmud. This is straight out of the Talmud. You can look it up in its original source as well. And we have to move on. Okay, moving on. Now, so if, if some dreams have meaning, and some people a little prophecy, the question is now, how serious do I need to take my dreams? How serious do I need to take them? So first we're gonna, first we're gonna, we're gonna bring from the Talmud, where the Talmud says, dreams, serious? Very serious, you gotta take them, it's really serious. Look at this interesting story on um, page 14, text 4. All right. Everyone's following? Do I go too slow, too fast? Are you sleeping already? Are you dreaming? <laughs> the joke is only funny once. Okay. <laughs> text 4 of the Talmud, track the Shabbat. Rabbi Yeshua, the son of Rabbi Ivi, visited the home of Rabbi Ashi. He host, his host appeared a third born calf, which is like the best meat, and offered it to him to eat. Abashi responded, sorry, I'm observing a fast. They countered, do you not agree with the ruling of Rabbi Yehuda that a person may break a self-imposed fast and repay his obligation by fasting on a different day? This is your time now. You're finished, stop the fast, eat the steak. Tomorrow you'll, you'll, you won't have the steak, tomorrow you'll fast, right? What does he say? Abashi replied, this is a fact due to a bad dream. The reason I'm fasting is because I had a bad dream. Rav Bamachasya told in the name of Rav Chama Bar Goya, who told in the name of Rav, that a fast nullifies the portents, the portents of a bad dream, like fire consumes flax. And Rav Chista stipulated that the fast is most effective when observed on the day of the dream. And Rav Yosef added that such a fast may even be observed on Shabbat. Wow. Let's, just, let's, let's, let's unpack this for a moment, right? So a fast is serious, and, uh, sorry, a, a dream is serious enough that to fast, what is the idea of fasting in Judaism? It, 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 it basically repentance. Mm -hmm. Fasting in Judaism 
is a way that you that you think about God and you repent of your of your of your misdeeds. Fasting is a serious business. And we have our few fast days a year, public fast days like Yom Kippur, like the one on Thursday before Purim. These are fast because there are these are public fasts. We all keep to them, especially Yom Kippur. But then there's personal uh, fast that you can take upon yourself, especially when something really bad happens or something. Uh, that's that, by the way, that's more in biblical times. We're going to see later today. It's not recommended anymore. But the point is not so much explaining why the fast. But the point is that dreams is so serious that some this somebody had a bad dream. Ready? Is you, you got to fast even when on Shabbat. There is no fast day. On Just Shabbat. by choice, you're not allowed to fast Shabbat. The biblical command to celebrate, to be joyful. Joyful means to eat challah, wine, right? Kishka, cholin, good stuff. You got to eat on Shabbat. You're not allowed to fast. The only time, with the exception Yom Kippur, that on a, the only time where a person can on themselves take upon a fast. Is when they have a bad dream. Okay, so we just my point is from this text, the Talmud says dreams we take really serious. You had a bad dream, you better you better repent because something bad can really happen. Oh, hold on, that huh? the next text five. This is a uh, Spanish rabbi, Rabbi Shlomo El Moli, right, thirteenth century, fascinating uh, rabbi who who was. Um, you can read on the side know who he was, but he writes as follows. Text, page 15. A person who has a bad dream should not say, the decree has already been sealed and all hope is lost. The possibility of rectification through repentance and supplication is always available, even for the worst dream imaginable. So what are we, what are we learning from here? Number one, dream is, a, is some type of prediction of something bad if you have a bad dream, something bad might happen to you, but that's not the end, meaning it's not certainty. You have the power to change that destiny. How so? Via repentance. The person should fast, repent, and pray for mercy. If one does so, God will accept the feast, repentance, and prayer, and he will cancel all negative decrees that were issued. The negative events pretended by the dream will be revoked swiftly like... Fire consumes flax. What was the idea? Fire consumes flax. They will be revoked completely. Just as fire consumes flax completely without leaving any remnant, unlike wood, which always leaves some remnant after being burnt. Meaning, this is important, two lessons, right? Number one, we are not bound by the destiny. The decree will be revoked. As swiftly as fire consumes flax, if we do repentance. Number two, and that's so important. And I want you to listen to this important because this is going to be really the key to the whole course. <clears throat> Judaism believes that our destiny is not set in stone. Okay? And every human has the power to change his or her future through positive actions. Okay? We're not bound by a destiny. We shape our destiny. Each of us shape our own destiny. So even if you get a message, and we're going to do this next week again when it comes to astrology, that this might be a very bad thing happen to you, we don't despair, oh my gosh, I'm done, I'm doomed, this is my destiny. You and only you have the power to change that outcome. We're going to get back to this uh, over this course. Now, if we do proper repentance, the decree will completely abolish like fire consumes flax without any remnant. Okay, before we go here. On the flip side, if we look through the Talmud, we find a whole different perspective about dreams. So this, till now we establish dreams are serious business, correct? Everyone's scared here, All right, relax. Let's take a deep breath. <laughs> we're gonna find a whole different perspective. And that is, and we're gonna um, read two texts, that 
dreams are a result of our imaginations. It has nothing to do with prophecy, nothing to do with destiny. Dreams have, look, and, and, there's, a, and there's a fascinating, funny story, a wild story in this next text. Let's read it. Text 6, page 17. <clears throat> Rabbi Shmuel ben Nachmani taught in the name of Rabbi Yonatan. People are only shown in their dreams the products of their own thoughts. Like Nancy, as you said about the kids, right? We're all kids. And here's, a fast, here's, a fun, here's a fun story. The Roman emperor once said to Rabbi Shur, the son of Rabbi Hananiah, you Jews claim to be very wise. Tell me, then, what will I see in my dreams tonight? Rabbi Shur replied, you will see the Persians capture and enslave, enslave you and force you to, to herd pigs with a golden staff. The emperor thought about this vision all day, and guess what? At night, he saw it in his dream. <laughs> king Shapur, who was the uh, Persian king, once said to Shmuel, another, another, another Talmudic scholar, you just claim to be very wise. Tell me when, what will I see in my dreams tonight? Shmuel replied, you will see the Romans take you captive and force you to grind date pits with a golden mill. The king thought about his vision all day, and at night he saw it in his dream. Okay. Right? Why did he, why did he dream about it? He thought about it all day, right? Especially you get the details, right? The bits and the golden mill. The more you think about the details. You know. so, those, so, so, uh, so from this text, dreams, it's just nothing. It's just, it's just, just a, a result of your imagination. Another text, before we get to another text, a little introduction to a Jewish law. Um, back in biblical times, a farmer had to, uh, before he was able to enjoy uh, the produce, he had to give a 10% to the Kohen, another 10 to the Levites, and then it was a certain percentage of his crop before he really enjoyed everything that God says, it's called Maser Sheni, not important the name, but this word Maser Sheni, where he was to take a certain percentage, I think another 10% of his produce, and bring it to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, he would eat his produce. In other words, instead of eating in a farm in the Negev, right, he would have to travel and schlep wagons of his fruits to Jerusalem. And there he would sit down and enjoy the fruit uh, that, of his fruit in the Holy City of Jerusalem. And the reason was so he should, uh, that we should, we, the, the Torah wants a farmer to be included in the happenings of Jerusalem. That we value you, you can come, you invite it and celebrate with us, or to recognize that his produce uh, give thanks to God, etc. However, because there was so much produce to take and schlepping all this, the Torah says there's another way to do it. You can, you can do it called uh, pidyon, which means you would say, let's say you have 100 apples that you have to bring. Instead of taking 100 apples, what's the value? Let's say $100. You could take a $100 bill and say this is instead of the apples. And I'm going to take the $100 bills and travel to Jerusalem, and then he'll go to the market and buy 100 apples with the money, and he fulfilled the obligation of Maser Sheni, of thanking Hashem. That's the, in a nutshell, the mitzvah. Now listen to this story in text 7 about a dream. Text 7. <clears throat> a person was troubled about the whereabouts of money that his deceased father left for him. He, he dreamed that his father told him exactly how much money it was and where it could be found, but that it was consecrated as my sir Shani. He went, meaning that this money that, that, that his father told me that, that is hidden, you cannot use it. You have to take that money and bring it to Jerusalem and buy lots of falafel and eat over there, right? So, but this is all a dream. So what happens? He wakes up. He, wa he, went, he, he went to the specific place and indeed found the, spe the specified sum of money. Mazel tov. He found, he found the treasure. Now you have the question, is this money holy money as to take Jerusalem or can he keep the money? Only information was from where? From the dream. What do you say? What do you say? Holy money or regular money? Regular money. Holy money? If dream, the dream was 
I don't know where the money is, right? And the dream told him, his father came, here's, this is how much money, and this is where it is. But you should know it's holy money. Don't buy a car. You've got to go up to Jerusalem, right? And then he goes and he finds it. That means the dream was true. So now the question, what can you do with the money? So he goes to the sages. The sage instructed this person that the, con the content of dreams are irrelevant and he need not treat the money as Masha Shem. Interesting, no? Interesting. Okay. So kind of dismiss it. Like the, the, the sage says, big deal. It's just a dream. Just a dream. So even if it comes true, still it's still only a dream. Kind of puzzling. So we have, again, have a, now I, we have two ideas. One is serious, the dreams are really serious, and one of the other sources, dreams are not so serious. So how do we, how do we reconcile those two texts? And for that, my friends, we're going to go into angels and demons. Who's ready? All oh, right, let's do it. <laughs> okay. The key to understand this conflict of these two ideas is in the next passage, text 8, page 20. Two biblical verses about dreams. Yes. Yes. That I that explained that money that has that had to be uh, taken to Jerusalem to buy produce. Okay. Huh? What's the right translation? Uh, oh, second tie. Second tie. I'm sorry. Tie. Maser is tie. 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 Or the hiding ten percent. Shani means second. So second round. Yes. Yes. But I, I don't want to miss you. It's really uh, that's all right. Let's look at two. Uh, important passages in the in the in the Talmud. Talmud says two passages, text eight. Rabbi said a contradiction between two verses. In one verse, God says, "I speak with the prophet in a dream," Numbers twelve six. But the second verse states, "Dream speak falsely." Same idea, right? One says it's a prophecy. One is it's it's false. It's nothing. The Talmud resolves this. There are two types of dreams. Some come by means of an angel, and some come by means of a demon. Ooh. <laughs> okay, now it's getting spicy. Some comes by an angel, and some come by a demon. All right. What exactly are angels and demons? We're going to learn that in lesson four. That's where we're going to go exactly, what an angel or what a demon. But for now, angels are positive spiritual forces, heavenly forces that live in a he heavenly realm. And when we sleep, our soul ascends to, the, to a heavenly realm, and we encounter these heavenly angels. So look in text 9. The previous Rebbe writes this beautifully, text 9, page 21. At a certain time during sleep, souls rise up to the heavenly academy. Each soul going to the hall it is associated with. In general terms, the location, the heavenly palace where a person's soul rests at night is commensurate with the spiritual sta statue that they have achieved with their daytime divine service. More specifically, if a person observed the mitzvah, studied Torah, prayed in a more beautiful and complete manner that day, or went to sleep with words or thoughts of Torah on their minds, they merited a loftier location in heaven. So, yes, your spiritual state, the way you conduct yourself by day, is a consequence how you how your soul gets elevated at night while you're sleeping. The heavenly palace contains hallways, colonnades, lounges, American Express lounges, first thing, <laughs> and halls in which the soul can rest when it rises to heaven to draw new life during sleep. So basically, during sleep, right, our souls kind of interact with angels, and angels, if, we, if we're worthy of it, angels will give us certain messages in our dreams, and obviously these are the dreams, as the Zohar says in text 10, very important, text 10, while a person sleeps, the soul rises to the level of the holy angels and receives certain information, learns new things, and then returns to its place. This is an experience of connecting to holiness. Fascinating. All right. And so what are the demons? I want to know about the juicy. What are the demons? 
Um, so again, in lesson four, we're going to learn about the Jewish, uh, Jewish idea behind demons. But in the context of dreams, we're not talking about demons as we think of demons. We actually think demons is negative uh, thoughts that the person has. Negative thoughts that the person has. Um, and look in text 11. That this is a product of our unholy possessed mind, un of unholy possessed mind. In text 11, false dreams are the product of an unhealthy possessed imagination. The sage of the term demon, this is a Barda term, to describe this negative destructive spirit that afflicts a person. Dreams from this source are meaningless, this is really key, and one should not be concerned about them at all. Why not? It's in the Yiddish we say it's shtusim, it's shtuyot. It's nonsense because it's your own, it's your own problem. It's your own problem. It's your own doing. All right. So let's look. At, let's recap. Angels are positive spiritual forces, occupy heavenly realm when our souls visit while we sleep. All right. And able to communicate divine information to us. Demons are really impure spiritual beings in the context of dreams, a metaphor for product of the mind. And this is really, um, oopa. So the question really is, what can I do to meet the angels at night, right? <laughs> not the, and not my own demons. Huh? <laughs> and, and really, how do I know? How do I know which dream is coming from angels, right? And I don't know which dream, my dreams come from a demon perspective, right? Not real demons. We're not, we're not talking about the demons in, in, in angelic demons. We're talking here, right? Metaphor, products of my mind. How do I know? We're gonna, we, gotta, we have to unlock this mystery. So please follow along with me. I'm taking you on a journey, okay? Everyone's following? When it comes to dreams, there's two types of dreams. <clears throat> um, simple dreams of visions that have no directives. It doesn't tell us anything to do. Just things you see, right? Um, nothing practical. So the question then is, if I have this dream, you ask, is it real or not? It really doesn't matter. Not quite, right? If you just have a vision, right? The ocean, the whale, something, right? Doesn't give you any directives. Does it matter to know if it's real or not? Does it matter to know if it comes from angels or demons? It doesn't really matter. But it does matter emotionally. Especially if we sometimes, so many of us have seen loved ones in dreams, right? So most times when we see loved ones in our dreams, we could apply that this is because you were thinking of them. Very normal, right? You're thinking of them, then you're dreaming of them. That doesn't necessarily mean that there is a communication or something real to it that you need to, um, you need to really uh, figure out what happened. Okay? But the second part, so the other part, Second category of dreams is that when what happens when you have a dream when something does tell me to do, right? You something tells me what to do, or like in the story of the money, where the father says, "This is how much money, and this is where it is, and this is holy money," right? So now, what do you do? Is it real or is it not real? Well, if it's about money, go check it out. What can you lose, right? So if it's about something positive, you you we can we can say, go check it. Why not? Do more positive. But what happens if it's something destructive or something negative that the dream is asking you to do? What do you do then? Is it real or not real? We need to know. Um, so the approach is, in generally, all our dreams, we have no idea. We, we, we have no certainty. So when in doubt, it remains in doubt. That's it, right? So look, look in text 12. 
we have reconciled the sages' teaching and reached the logical conclusion that some dreams are valid and should be taken seriously, while others are meaningless and should be ignored. We are now left with the question of how to relate to a specific dream. How are we to know if this is valid or meaningless? The general rule is, any, in any situation of doubtful ownership, is to leave the item in question in the hands of the person who currently possessed it. That is why the Talmud state that the person who had a dream pointing to the location of my Sosheni inheritance shall disregard his dream, leaving the money under his full ownership as it had been prior to the dream. Dreams are irrelevant as far as taking money out of the possession of its owner. All right? So if I have a dream that, uh, that, right, that your money belongs to me, <laughs> it's meaningless, right? We don't, we don't follow that, that type of stuff, like we see in the story. Um, but, in other words, dreams are false until proven. Until proven. And even when it's proven, like part of the dream was right, but the money, right, where he found the money, that doesn't mean that this last part is correct. So basically, all I'm telling you today right now at this point is, I'm leaving you hanging. Where are you hanging? One side, right? I'm telling you, some dreams are right. A lot of dreams are just imagination. Some dreams come from angels, some come from demons. And what? We don't know. We don't know. Thank you, Rabbi. You didn't help me out here. <laughs> Now, huh? Are these more yes, yes. Now, if you have nightmares, because you don't know, and because it's a possibility that there is something, because there is a possibility that this dream might be a prophecy, and it's really something bad, what should you do? Fasting, right? Fasting. Because we then take it serious. Not because I know for sure. Again, it's imagination, dreams speak falsehoods. If it's from angels, dreams are miniature prophecy. Ever some information is false. So how can we identify the source of a dream and assess how seriously it can be taken? We said two, two, two types of dreams, simple visions, practical relevance. And I was coming to this one. So again, imagination. What is the quote from the Talmud? If it's our imaginations, they're false. If it's from angels, then you know the dreams are miniature prophecies. However, some information is false. So the dreamer is in doubt. What do you do? If it's something practical, money stays with the processor, but permission is granted to fast on Shabbat if you're having nightmares. Because you don't want to be on the safe side. If, God forbid, something is to happen that you, that you see in a dream, even that possibility just my imagination, fast. As we said, fast repentance, and if God forbid it was something to happen, you can change your destiny, and you're good to go. L'chaim. But there's more. There's more. There's more. There's more. There's more. Because, yes. Because, because at the end of the day, everything we've learned till now is, at the end of the day, the dreamer is in doubt. We just want to be safe. If you want to say fast, but if it's in doubt, you stay, right? We just stay, stay status quo. We don't change things. And now we come to the more practical part of the class. So if you slept till now, wake up. <laughs> um, actually, there's, there's a beautiful story. that happened, didn't happen, I don't know, but it's a beautiful story. And it's a beautiful metaphor in life. It's not so much connected, but I'll, I'll throw it in. They say, uh, say you have a Jew in Pro uh, that lived in a shtetl outside of Prague, and he always wanted to become wealthy. He was a poor man. He always wanted to become wealthy. He really, he really worked hard. But all day he wanted to become wealthy. So one night he has a dream that in the big city of Prague, under the bridge, under the bridge, there is a treasure buried. So he dismisses the dream. The next day, the same dream again and over and over. So he figures, what does he have to lose? Maybe there's something to it. He travels to the city, travels to Prague. So he comes to the bridge. He sees our guard standing by the bridge. So what is he going to do? Start digging in front of the guards? So he's not sure what to do. So he's waiting, waiting with a shovel. And he's waiting for a moment where the guards are not watching. And quickly he jumps and starts digging, digging, digging. And as he starts digging, the guard sees him and says, Hey, what are you doing? He says, Ah, oh, what are you doing? Well, I had the dream. Well, well, 
I had a dream that there's a treasure bear here. And the guard says to laugh. Oh, enough, and I, not, another you, 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 you know, Meshuggah, you know what? The guard says, I had a dream, the guard tells him, that there's this, that there's this little shtetl out of Prague, and this is Jew, and he lives in this little hut, and under the oven, a dream is, a, a treasure is buried. And he's like, this is my house. You dreamed about my house. Yeah, it's nonsense. So he runs back home. And sure enough, he digs what happens. He finds the treasure under the floor. Okay. Well, the metaphor is, we always try to look in life somewhere else, right? If I just have this, I have this. The treasure is always buried inside of you. Okay, it's not so relevant, but just a good story. Why not? All right, now I get your attention back. That's a good story. Come to this next part of the class, and we have about another 10, 15 minutes. The Alter Rebbe, the first Rebbe Chabad, who lived 300 years ago, who wrote the book Tanya and the and Hasidic philosophy, um, takes a second approach about dreams that gives us a formula to resolve the doubt, um, at, least at, at least partially. And he says that key to uh, keep about dreams is to assess your own spiritual state. Look in text 13. We'll, we'll read his text. That's from his <clears throat> text 13, page 27. I heard explicitly from my grandfather and teacher of blessed memory that one should not be worried at all about such matters like dreams. Teaching in the Talmud that lend great significance to dreams only apply to people of great spiritual stature whose thoughts are distanced from these matters. If this person has an uncharacteristic experience, it must be divinely orchestrated and is therefore cause for concern. However, a person who thoughts regularly wander to such matters has no reason for concern. My grandfather repeated this many times and would dismiss people that were miserable as a result. You should completely ignore this and be joyful. So, basically, what is he saying? That all the dreams that we're talking in the Talmud that are coming from the level of angels, right? That have some kind of prophecy. And that if you have a bad dream, such bad dreams, right? Because angels can give communication even about bad things that happen. You must fast. You should fast even on the Shabbos. It is about a dreamer who is on a spiritual level to have this type of communications. But he tells his people, most people today, if not all, you, you're not on that level. And all your dreams is literally a result of your own imaginations. So don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it. Ignore it. Dismiss it. Ignore it. And fasting um, is also fasting is for the is is for the spiritual person, who on a very spiritual level they need to do a little bit more spiritual, um, you know, um, um, examination. So those whole fasting idea is for spiritual people, very spiritual, uh, high ele elevated people, not for the regular people. But, and. Um, especially he says that repentance, that, that, that uh, fasting should not be done today because it weakens people's being and you can't serve God when you're physically are weak, right? Rather, you should engage in positive activities like prayers and good deeds and mitzvot. When you do experience a dream, that worries you. So number one, don't pay too much attention to it. You're not that spiritual. And number two, number two, even if you do are worried about it, you just, instead of fasting, you don't have to fast. You can substitute that with prayer, charity, mitzvot. mitzvot. As a matter of fact, we have a prayer for dreams. Do you know that? There's a Jewish prayer for everything, right? The Jewish prayer for the, after you go to the bathroom, the Jewish prayer for everything. There is a Jewish prayer for dreams. And it's uh, too bad because, uh, because we, say, we say this prayer on a holiday. On every holiday, we do the blessing of the Kohan, Yichat Kohanim, where the Kohan comes up front 
and she and, and we and we and he covers his face with the talit and he does the hands like this and he says the blessing right may God bless you while he says it is a prayer in Al Sidur about dreams this is the prayer I encourage you to read the prayer when you come to the service but here's the prayer text 14 on um, page 29 Master of the universe, I am yours, and my dreams are yours. I have dreamed a dream, and I do not know what it is. May it be your will, my God, the God of my fathers, that all my dreams concerning myself or concerning any other Jew shall be for the good. Whether dreams I dreamed about others, or whether about by myself, or whether, or, or whether others dreamed about me, dreamt about me. If they are good dreams, strengthen them and reinforce them, and may they be fulfilled in me and in them, like the dreams of Joseph. But well, if they require a remedy, heal them like Hezekiah, king of Judah, from his illness, like Miriam, the prophetess, from her leprosy, like Naaman from her, his leprosy, like the waters of Marah by Moses, and like the waters of Jericho by Elisha. And as you change the curse of the wicked Balaam, Bilam was the, this, this non-Jewish prophet, from a curse into a blessing, so shall you change all my dreams concerning myself and concerning all of Israel to good, Guard me, be gracious to me, and favor me. And you don't have to wait for the holidays. You can say this prayer anytime. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a bad dream, or you have a good dream that you like to happen, read this prayer. Uh, uh, and you don't have to fast. You do not have to fast. No, not, don't, it's not recommended to fast. Fasting is not recommended. Um, so, now, so we said we got to determine the nature of the dream, the dream of the dreamer, right? I want to add something here that's not in the text. But I remember one of my first classes I gave being a rabbi here. Maybe Judy remember that, Judy Zangwill. I was invited uh, years ago at the JCV to give a, a give a class to Kabbalah on dreams. Well, they, we're talking about seventeen years ago, and ever since I've been sleeping. <laughs> A little middle Kabbalistic. But there, from what I remember, there was a, a text that I found in the Talmud that says, a person who hasn't dreamt in seven days is considered a wicked person. Wow. A person who hasn't dreamt in seven days is considered a Russia. A Russia is a, a wicked person. That person. Um, on the other hand, says that dreams means absolutely nothing. I explained something interesting. I found that in Kabbalah. And again, it's not in this class, but I'm going to add it because you guys just want to hear more stuff, right? Okay. So listen to this for a moment. Kabbalah says our minds are constantly operating. Our mind never stops. And our minds not just stop, but they create energy. And they create words, letters, right? When we're thinking, letters. So just like God created the universe through speech, and we learned in Kabbalah, right, that word, speech, is an expression of the insight. Our thought constantly is moving and creating all this language, all these words, and then we need to filter it and speak about it. Now, what happens is a spiritual person or refined person who thinks positive things, thinks holy things, right, what happens at night when we sleep, all this that was in our heads needs to go somewhere. It has to be released. Are you following? So if it's spiritual in nature, if a majority of your, of your thinking is prayer, meditation, right, positive thinking, when you go to sleep, all these thoughts get elevated like you spoke in heavenly with angels and you have the ability to communicate. These are powerful. These are holy dreams. But if they're not, even if they're mundane, they're just mundane thoughts, which most people have, they go nowhere. They go nowhere. So when we sleep, there's a release. It doesn't go up. It doesn't go down. It doesn't go in anywhere. It just releases. That's how when you sleep, the next morning, what happens? You have a clear mind. Correct? How is it? You go to sleep, and you can't think straight. The next morning, right? Clarity. With the coffee, though. Right? Clear. But God gave us that gift us every day when we go to sleep. Now, the Talmud says, so this is the average person. So you have a holy person, angels. Average person, 
that older stuff gets released. Next morning, you're like a fresh slate, and you start thinking again, 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 next morning, again. However, if you're, and, it, and that's why you have dreams. So most of your dreams are really what? Just a release. It's just imaginations of what you have thinking during the day. Now, if you didn't, and Ethel, I'm not talking about you, please. <laughs> yeah. I'll explain, I'll explain, I'll tell you why. Now that Thomas is the, but it's a third level. And that is a person who is so crazy, who thinks negative, who is evil. And his mind gets so fashed up, we say in Yiddish, you know? What fashed up means? It's so clogged, right? That you can't, it doesn't drain. That's his sleep or her sleep doesn't get the release, Kabbalah says, so they don't dream at all. The person that says, I haven't dreamt in seven days, something really wrong with you. Something is really, and it means that your mind is so fushed up. So you got to work on yourself. It's fascinating. So again, it kind of can answer our question, right? Why do we know? But um, let's go back here to this last part. Um, I want to finish with um, a letter on page 32, text 15. There was a fellow who wrote to the Rebbe um, that he had, uh, he had some really bad dreams. And, he, and the dreams are about um, about the his angry dreams about injustice of the world, right? right? Can you relate? Right? Oh yeah, right. And the world is all going mad, and as a result, um, he in his dream he's considering that the message is that he has to ascend from this world. Right? Not a healthy human being, and he's writing to the Rebbe about this, and the Rebbe write, writes back to him as follows: Text fifteen. As a general rule, there is no need for instructions to be communicated through dreams. For instruction, God gave each and every one of us the Torah, the Torah of truth and life, which illuminates a Jew's path in life. We have our Torah, which is the, which is the manual for life. You want to know how to live? Read what the Torah says, right? When one isn't observing God's instruction given in the Torah, remember, the Rebbe's writing this to this individual, okay? One may sometimes receive a hint regarding this in a dream or the like. It is certain that the message of your dream is not about injustice in the world in the little sense, for such issues are completely beyond your ability to rectify. Rather, the straightforward meaning of your dream is clear. You're being shown that you need to be angry about the fact that your world, your personal life that you exercise full control over, is being conducted unjustly, contrary to divine justice. And you must ascend quote unquote, from this mode of conduct to actual day-to-day -day behavior in accordance with God's instruction as stated in the code of Jewish law. Right? So he's telling the person that you need to take some, some uh, you got to take some accounting on yourself. Right? All right. Um, I'm going to jump here. We're almost done. Pat, if you have two more minutes, I'm almost done. Or you have to go, you have to go. Um, how about nightmares? How about nightmares? A happy person has nightmares after nightmares after nightmares, right? Which you say, okay, it's imagination, it's whatever, it's demons, it's nonsense. But it bothers me. I wake up in the middle of the night, right? How many of us, after October 7, woke up with nightmares, right? Including myself. So what do we do? What do we do? The Rebbe writes, and this is important, it's very practical. Page 35, text 16. Regarding disturbing dreams, it is well known, and the sages teach us about this, that people only see in the dreams the product of their own thoughts. Dreams are the result of idle daytime thoughts, and when the cause is reduced, the result will automatically be minimized. And he says you should be particular about reciting the bedtime Shema and ensure that the mezuzah of your bedroom is kosher. So, what's advice for better dreams? Focus on your thoughts. Boost your spiritual well-being. Your spiritual well-being 
say it as a special prayer. You know, we say the Shema in the morning. We're supposed to also say the Shema at night before we go to sleep. And after the Shema, there's a beautiful prayer that we say right before we go to sleep called the Hamapil prayer. And it's not in the book here, maybe it is, but I made a copy for you. You have a copy? Okay. Right here. And on it you have, can I have somebody one copy quick? Just for now. Go back to you. On the, and this is for you to keep this on your nightstand. This is all a gift. You have the Shema prayer in Hebrew and English, also transliteration. Say that before you go to sleep. I have it. I have this, and I say this every single night. My children say it every single night. We say it together with the kids. It's a beautiful way. We say the Shema. We sing the Shema together. And then there's a blessing called Hamapil. The cool part about this is a side note. After you say this blessing, you're not supposed to speak anymore. And I do this with my kids. I says, once you say Hamapil, no more talking. It works for five minutes. <laughs> Absolutely, it's not a kids' prayer; it's for everyone' prayer. But I want to read together in the Shema. You all know, but look at the other side, where it says, "Blessed, blessed are your Lord, our God, King of the Universe, who causes the bond of sleep to fall upon my eyes, and slumber upon my eyelids, and who gives light to the apple of the eye. May be your, your will, Lord my God, and the God of my fathers." to let me lie down in peace and to rise me up to a good life in peace. Let my thoughts not trouble me, nor bad dreams, nor sinful fancies, and may my bed be perfect before you. Give light to my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep, sleep of death. Blessed are you, Lord, who his glory, his glory gives light to the whole world. On the other side, after the Shema, if you look in the middle, there's another one-liner, I entrust my spirit into your hand, you will redeem me, the Lord, uh, Lord God of trust, which basically when we go to sleep and just do this a little exercise, take it a minute, a little meditation, right? That you think about God, you think about your actions, which actually, this is the short version, but if you look in the Siddur, there's also a section where we ask, where we do a little confession, we ask for forgiveness. Every day, think about it, God, if I've done this, I ask for forgiveness. I want to be better tomorrow. Think about Hashem as you go to sleep. And by the way, about the death, right? Lest the sleep be the sleep of my death. But not only real death, it says that when we sleep, we're experiencing, similar to the 160, a taste of 160 of death while you're sleeping. And when you wake up in the morning, what do we say? Modeh Ani, we thank Hashem for giving back our soul. So let's watch the recap and... Um, And the mezuzah, by the way, you know the mezuzah protection, right? But mezuzah, don't make the mistake that it's only the front door. It was a nice case. Mezuzah spiritual uh, protection has a physical result. So make sure that it also in your bedroom, every room, especially when you have challenges, if it's health challenges, others, call me, they're happy to give you a mezuzah, make sure we're checking mezuzahs, it should be kosher. Okay, and I forgot that the thing doesn't work, but um, just to recap, we learned today, look on page 37, the key points. We learned that meanings, the dream can either be very meaningful or very not meaningful, right? Um, we learned that dreams, um, um, can, even if they're meaningful, not necessarily they have, um, not every, every detail is accurate. And really what's important, we didn't discuss this in this class also, is who does the interpretation. It takes a Joseph to interpret a dream. Who Joseph was a spiritual person. So even if the dream is correct, and even if you're a spiritual person, you must seek the guidance of the spiritual to interpret your dream. Um, as a, as, and, and, uh, but, but generally, and this is really for our, us, us, uh, Unless we're talking about spiritual people here, so not not this class. You guys are all holy spiritual people. That's what I'm taking so serious. But for simple people like myself, you have a dream. Don't pay attention to it. Don't pay. Don't direct your life. Ask yourself: Am I serving God? Am I doing? Am I waking up in the morning? Make a prayer. Put on to fill in. That is the power that will determine. Give us the blessings that we need. Everything else, don't pay too much attention to it. And say the prayers and and do the good stuff. And you will have a lot of fun. Next week, we will discuss um, the uh, astrology, the stars, and um, 
can we see future? Can we see the potential of the future? Um, what do we say? Mazel? What's a good mazel? Do we believe in mazel? Which mazel means what? Yeah. Luck. Do we believe in mazel? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Are we are we bound to mazel? Yeah. No. Okay. You guys don't need the class. I get it. <laughs> uh, last thing. If you are here today for the first class and you want to continue, I invite you to continue. Encourage you. But please let Freddie outside know so we can make sure those who don't have a book yet that you get your book. And um, it was a great, it was a great experience. I hope everyone, please wake up. And... Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank it comes to me that you thought about them a lot. So we can't know for sure unless there is a real directive. Oh. <laughs> I know my prayer. Please, can you handle mine? Just give it to me. You take it and give me. I love you. Okay. You're welcome. Frank, good to see you. Nice to see I'm you. I'm so happy you came in. Thank you. <laughs> oh, somebody has a question yeah. quick. One second. We'll be right back. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, oh, of course, of course. Good seeing you. Oh.